words about uh, themselves and also to uh, make an initial statement. Uh, what's the personal relation to the pandemic's uh, value of information, value of structural health monitoring methods, and what may be the future potential uh, of these methods for the infrastructure integrity management? So, uh, yeah, who wants to start? So we give the word to Michael and then we walk to the right side. Well, um, the, the concept which we have tried to, uh, to, to, um, to provide in this cost action here uh, really tries to uh, close the hole uh, in, in, in the logical approach which has been evolving over years um, whereby we, we try to use what we call non-structural means uh, as a vehicle to learn more about the performance of the structural systems that we are dealing with and thereby uh, optimize decisions on how to manage the perform performance of these systems. Um, I would say, um, from a methodological point of view, uh, we, are, we are succeeding because we are pulling our way through, uh, let's say, the formalistic way of how should it be done, and which are the important points. Uh, to take into account uh, which are the models which are required but when it comes to the uh, presentation of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of what we have been doing um, maybe we, we, uh, we, we could learn more on how to uh, optimize that and, and uh, of course this is decisive for impact so if the message that doesn't go really out over the table, uh, the impact will not be uh, optimal. But I think the, the approach which we all could take uh, when we are trying to disseminate the, the ideas, and I think maybe most people here in the room, they, they have a good idea uh, on what we are trying to achieve, is to look at the management of the performance of structures and systems involved in structures um, from a little bit a different perspective. So essentially when you cut off all the flesh uh, and you only have the skeleton uh, remaining in, in the problem, it is an information management problem. And we can manage information on these systems to all sorts of decisions from the very early phases in design uh, over the manufacturing and the construction and the uh, operation phase and over the decommissioning and to the rebuilding and whatever, all phases, it's an information management problem. And when you do that, it becomes completely obvious that, uh, of course, just flat information at obtained from observing what is going on is also information. Just like information can be bought by buying a beam made out of a high quality steel instead of a low quality steel. It's all information. And I think this is the way we need we need to uh, we need to approach this and also to communicate it. And for a large number of uh, relevant problems uh, basing decisions on how best to buy additional information uh, adequately takes place in the knowledge we already have about what information we might be able to achieve. Uh, and this is the whole idea um, behind what we are doing. So we are anticipating that new information will follow our knowledge to the best we know uh, about the phenomena. But when we get the new information, we are able to act according to what we observe. And this is what we have heard repeatedly, and I'm very happy uh, to hear this from the audience today, that we, have, we, uh, we surely and strongly agree that new information is triggering actions, 
changes in what we're doing. And this is why it has been created. And this is what we can really um, uh, exploit in this approach here. I probably did not really answer specifically your question, but I hope that this is an initiation for further comments and discussions. Thank you. Yeah, um, I represent the end users. So uh, I think I'm uh, for the upper level side of things. I think we're, I think the methods can improve safety on our assets. And I think uh, it will improve also to extend the lifetime. Uh, from experience back home, uh, we severe suffer from over inspection and under inspection. And we suffer from over maintenance and under maintenance. And I think being more analytical in our decision, decision basis and not being subjective or relying on uh, experience and past practice, I think it's very useful to be more precise when we decide to do something. Uh, so I think it will definitely improve asset management. So, have uh, huge consequences for society as a whole. Like, uh, extending lifetime by 1% is a huge impact. Thank you very much. Cool. Okay. Yes. Yes, I, I think there was, there was a, a value of information during this session because we, we, yeah, we learned a, a, a lot. And um, I, I remember when we began the project that um, what was difficult is to is to analyze that um, we have several um, um, several fields of engineering: uh, the monitoring, the engineering, the decision uh, societies, or, and um, and it's very difficult to make the link between all uh, these uh, these companies. And what was uh, really interesting today is to, to observe that uh, there is a need, a need to, to link um, the engineering with um, the, the monitoring and with, uh, with the results of the monitoring and to, to, to make that uh, as a whole uh, package and the monitoring should not be only um, a subcontract uh, and, uh, by, and to, to, uh, to a society that that deliver sensors, and that should be included in the engineering process. And I think that was a, uh, that that was quite new. We didn't probably we didn't think about that before. And so I think it was very interesting to see that uh, at the beginning we observed that, and now we know that this link is very very important because engineers and designers know exactly how the, the structure should work, and the materials, the selection of materials that was uh, that was made, and so on. Um, and, um, and and another another thing that probably we, we could um, that, that was interesting is um, is the concept of catalog uh, because um, there is a, there is probably a, a indicators not sensors but indicators that are more appropriate to uh, to deliver an information of a, on a on a damage and. Um, and this type of indicators could be classified, and uh, it could help after to select the good sensor that helps to compute and to 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 assess this indicator. So I think it was uh, it was interesting to see that. Thank you, Hank. Well, uh, I'm repeating always the same thing. Well, not in this meeting, but uh, several meetings I've had already. Uh, so my 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 role in this construction maybe is a little bit uh, from the industry side. So although my profile is also research based, but I have a, a lot of experience in the industry. And from my understanding on these four years almost of discussion on this, I think it's there are several things that perhaps might be marginal of this uh, problem, but they are. Um, Quite important to have an effective uh, approach to succeed on the implementation of this valuable information from ACGEN. So I put here some notes along the way of, the, of this presentation. So, mainly three 
I think there is something that is important in these meetings that we are doing today. I hope this might be one of many for the future, but definitely we need to think about you know, how we should uh, embed these ACGM systems, either if it's periodic or punctual or permanent as in the Gerobuser Bridge, but how we this is framed in the asset management for owners. Yeah? So there are uh, thousands of bridges. How this should be framed, how, how the value of this ACGM should be included. And I think here, also it is necessary, maybe this takes some <clears throat> generations, but also to train our tech, uh, technicians that are uh, our experts, uh, that are uh, responsible for the asset management. Perhaps they need some skills, my point of view, I think, how to deal with this monitoring data, how to see this data, how it should be processed, how to use this value of information to claim it. But in this big picture of asset management, yeah, that we need to frame this in their framework because this is a learning process, so to improve, changing paradigms. That is also important, the second point from the three that I have here, is that uh, we need, I think it's urgent, I think at least as far as my knowledge since 15 years of practice in SHM, we are delaying uh, a part of some successful cases, but punctually, give a payback to owners and concessionaries to invest strategically on SHM. Yeah, so because at the end of the day, uh, it's a system that will be in their bridges, structures, and then uh, there are two options. Either they maintain the system and they embed the system in their asset management, or they get lost. It switch off, it don't take care of it. So this needs to be thought in the long term, but with a payback. And my opinion is payback, it goes to an upper level, which perhaps is less technical, but it's supported and grounded in the technical level, as Michael said, on the part of information uh, theory and framework and evolving, is that perhaps uh, owners need some support from us in trying, for example, this is my vision, personally, uh, as I presented this morning, something like a technical recommendation that they may help, they should, I think, help us to write it down properly because the language should be non-technical, should be in the language from a decision-making point of view, a very short document which sets the grounds in all the guidelines that we are producing this construction, but allow them, perhaps, if they are happy to do it, approach the authorities to whom they are responsible for the, the concession, and try to renegotiate some terms of the contracts because if this point you reach this point, we close this sustainable cycle. Yeah. So we address, we analyze, we propose some renegotiations, we have more flexibility. I'm not saying that the step of recommendation should tell you how to do things, but at least should open a door to the owner to say, okay, we have some flexibility now. Let's see how we could optimize this approach when ACHM, volume of ACHM is as an evidence. It has an evidence. If you do this, I think we are being also fair to these people that look to ACHM as a, a tool. But I think, from my experience, I'm not saying that we are, we are guilty of that. It's not that level of knowledge, of course. But this, this work on the technical recommendation. It's not only about uh, giving more uh, technical evidence. No, I think it's more about uh, starting working more in the side of the decision makers and help them to write it down this type of document so they can approach authorities to think about how this could start changing a little bit. It's part of not only the experts or technicians or the owners, but also from the authorities. They become more sensitive. Perhaps, I would say, this technical recommendation will not succeed in the first approach, second, third, or whatever. But once we start having this approach of where we have this support of this construction, this huge community of 60, 60, 70 people signing this type of technical recommendation, showing that based on this construction uh, case studies, according to the techniques that we are applying, we show evidence on these assumptions. So perhaps the owner, if he has a similar case, case to this case study, 
we are giving to you some support to show that uh, it is worthwhile to think about it. But it's not, this is not uh, technical. This is, uh, I think also it's politics, I think. Mm -hmm. But we need to help them to sustain. So the reference of this document should be the guidelines, the euro codes, whatever, but the cutting edge uh, uh, research on the field. But in serving these uh, people that are willing to invest. But you need to be fair to them, not promising what they cannot, but at least they help them to give the ground if they are asked to give some more details. This is bad. So three points. Embedded ECDM system asset management, the payback to the owners, which I think then we need to work out some more top level document, very short. To support them if they are happy, they are willing to ask for some renegotiations in the contract journey. Was well, two points or three? Yeah. So the third was the technical. Yes. Yeah. If this could be a, an outcome that we are all happy, of course, I think it would be required for their side. Perhaps not yeah. for the research side, but for the industry side. Yes. My <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Please take a look at your thoughts. Yeah, so I think there are a lot of things can be said, of course, about the structural health monitoring and valuable information. Uh, for me, um, first of all, I think uh, structural health monitoring or structural health managing um, is very important. That's why the fact that uh, nowadays we have a, a big technology push for, for the for the sensing part. Uh, you don't necessarily uh, have to uh, bring parts of the structure to the lab and do experiments. Nowadays you can go outside and go to the structure and do um, um, and, and obtain the, the information about the structure. And the same also on, on the, the other end, the models they are available for, for, for decades now we are uh, developing a very nice uh, mechanical and physical and electrochemical uh, models. Uh, describing uh, phenomena. Um, and then the third thing is that um, there are a lot of structures out there. They are just uh, asking for it, so to speak, uh, for, for being structural health monitor, because they are, uh, are of quite, uh, they are having quite an age, maybe 50, 60 years now. It's, it's maybe a global problem, but only uh, on the rise of or USB mine. And um, having said this, and, I, and you look around, then it strikes me that such health monitoring is still not um, done very uh, often or much. And, and then for me, uh, value of information comes in because then I think uh, in the end, the uh, money talks. So if you want to uh, promote um, such health monitoring, such health managing, management, um, quantifying the, the added value of, of uh, monitoring in a, in, in a pure uh, objective way, and not only doing that, uh, but also providing uh, asset management toolings or decisions or policies uh, along the way, will for sure help the, the, the application of and development and, and, and successful application of structural health monitoring. So I didn't have too much time to prepare this. Uh, but, uh, I'll talk about this um, this session in the in the framework of asset management. In fact, I've been working on the reseeking of the, the asset management model of Prisa for the last two years. And in fact, all um, everything we talk about, I agree with the, with the panel. In fact, we are talking about um, the alignment, about asset performance monitoring. If, if, it, if, you, if we take uh, the, the, main, the, the main guidelines of the PAS 55, the thinking of the Institute of Asset Management, the ISO 55000, or everything regards to uh, asset performance monitoring, and in fact, we are uh, returning to performance our, our infrastructures and we can replace reactive actions and uh, by uh, 
sensory and long-term thinking. And if we can, in fact, develop behavior or degradating modeling, and in fact, to anticipate how we will be uh, uh, deploying our, our resources in maintenance. In fact, what the man managers want from us is not to tell them that, that we need a million more. They would like better to say that uh, in five years we need a million and we can uh, create <coughs> everything that will happen in the future and, and create a, a stable uh, line of, uh, of uh, resource consumption. In fact, all this is aligned with this thinking. And in fact, managers uh, would like from the technician community this capability to, to in fact, to instrument, to measure our, uh, not only bridges, in fact, uh, dikes, in fact, slopes. And we all need, in fact, a dashboard uh, that can start to, to driven us for the decisions. This behavior is becoming quite uh, strange. So it's better to prepare some actions now than uh, wait for some accident to happen. In fact, all this in fact makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your statements. Uh, yeah, that was already a lot of young statements. And, uh, to, uh, very large degree, I think, aligned. Uh, how should we enter the discussion? So we have basically two phases uh, here. We have the discussion uh, within the panel, and then uh, consecutively uh, we, um, we build up the interaction with the, uh, with the audience. <coughs> yeah. Anybody uh, to respond on uh, statements which have just been made? No, well, maybe uh, sh summing up uh, a little bit, uh, the, the, uh, the, the main way of looking uh, at, at the challenges and, uh, and, and potentials of the value of information and public and health monitoring has surely been directed on, on, uh, on let's say, a classical uh, engineering perspective still. And what do I mean by that? I'm coming back to your comment. Uh, why do we see reluctance in the Euro Revision Committees to include non structural means? Uh, the underlying uh, rationale for that is uh, an implicit fear that if we uh, if we if we have to rely too much on uh, the performance of the organizational capacity to run around and uh, make sure that monitoring devices are working and that information is utilized correctly and that criteria are set and checked, etc. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are pushing ourselves from the traditional civil engineering community uh, into a new corner. <laughs> Uh, where we maybe do not have too much experience yet, right? So uh, really trying to, to keep sim things uh, as simple as possible and, uh, and passive uh, as possible because then we don't have to rely on very complex speed. Okay, so having said that, uh, I also need to underline that that the next uh, evolution in the, in, in, in the development and maintenance of the built environment, it simply has to involve uh, active systems. Uh, it has to involve all the new technology uh, which is being uh, developed in, in, in different areas. Uh, this is the only way we can achieve uh, adequately efficiency in providing the functionality of, uh, of, of society and uh, and societal infrastructure. Uh, so we need, we need indeed this development. Um, and then maybe uh, what, what, we, what we could have done uh, here also is to actually directly, explicitly account for the part of the system, uh, not only the part of the system which we are measuring and monitoring, but also the part of the system which is actually conducting. Um, uh, all the uh, monitoring uh, in itself. Right? Uh, this would be very, very important to understand 
how the performance of that system actually adds uh, to, uh, to uh, achieving the objectives uh, in the management of the, of the structures of the built environment. And on that aspect, uh, also utilizing big data uh, and developing models uh, uh, taking basis in data mining, uh, which we uh, which we actually we, we have access to significant amounts of data on, on the performance of structures, but also on the performance on the organizations around the structures. So when we are when we are devising inspection or monitoring uh, strategies uh, at, the, at the level of this club, uh, I mean we are very often surprised to see what fragments of those <laughs> plans are actually being implemented. And also, when we are when we are checking uh, how did uh, actual uh, inspection results come or uh, monitoring results transform back into decisions, into actions? So we had the, all the strategies on paper, but in reality, how did it work? Uh, that type of knowledge is also really important. Uh, to get into the picture in order to, 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 to know what we're doing is actually maintaining uh, or <coughs> optimizing the objectives, right? And safety, uh, efficiency. So, but, but this, is, this is not, uh, let's say, a mistake or this is not a, an explicit shortcoming. It's just, it's just another um, step on the way in, in the evolution of the built environment and the management of the built environment. So we are we are initiating a process here in the in, in my opinion, which is super important. The traditional way of, of, uh, of, of designing and maintaining the built environment um, that cannot uh, that cannot persist uh, for a very long time. We have to significantly improve, and this year is one of the steps we are needed. Thank you very much. Maybe um, maybe, maybe the audience uh, could could come back. Maybe uh, especially the owners. Uh, reflecting on the main barriers, uh, which, which are the main barriers to get some of this, uh, uh, some of these ideas, some of these techniques, some of these possibilities uh, into action. I am from Wien, but I am from Brisbane, and for for what we have seen so far. Um, I think bridge owners need um, engineering judgment skills to, uh, to, to support the decision making process, to, 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 to bridge the gap between uh, that area of expertise and the, the, the people that make the decisions. And uh, I'm sorry to say this, but um, engineering judgment don't has a lot of value to, to top uh, top managers. This is my experience, um, and this brings me to, um, to one question. Uh, to two questions that I have, um, the, uh, related to the costs. Uh, the first one uh, we are talking about. Uh, we have been talking about. Um, uh, costs um, around the service lifetime of uh, the structures, and uh, we know in order to, to cost and convert, they, they, they for instance, uh, can be uh, discounted to, to the present. Uh, and moreover, uh, um, uh, costs are highly um, sensitive to, to discount rates. So I, 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 would, I would like to know how this um, uh, issue will work. That was addressed in the in the in the, in the case studies. In discounting rates, which are in the lower end, maybe around uh, two or three, they are already way too big. And the 
the gap, so the real problem here from a societal perspective, because this is what we're talking about, right? Uh, the societal perspective in maintaining the built environment. The real problem here is that the degradation of the built environment, if the degradation of the built environment is faster, so the rate of deterioration is faster than the economic growth, uh, then we are in severe problems, right? Uh, and discounting in that case uh, with a higher rate than the economic growth is going to <laughs> is really going to to be uh, let's say um, a big dive uh, at some point in time. So it's going to hollow out the economic capacity of society in a generation or two down the road. But but something close to the um, to the rate of economic growth. Thank you. Maybe we can take up the. Uh, the second question, uh, this, was, this was about the uh, concession periods. Yeah, anybody from the uh, panelists want to answer? No, I just want to maybe just to point out something that I think is in line with the uh, I think the question is not clear for me. Uh, there are some costs as well, not only the depreciating rating, but some costs that as far as my knowledge, so I'm just talking by myself, but I'm quite curious. Uh, some numbers that are very critical to be assessed, mainly, for example, a company like Brisa, or we don't want to focus always on Brisa, but companies like Brisa, so danger, high agency, thousands of bridges to maintain some of these type of companies that are private, they have some shares in the market. How, for example, you assess the uh, cost of loss of reputation? Yeah? So if there is a collapse of a bridge, how you assess this cost? And I think uh, something that's important for this time frame, uh, this is a suggestion for the future, I'm not criticizing at the moment, but I think there uh, are some people that should be joining this discussion, which is from economic. How do you assess this type of cost? Of loss of reputation. So I think we need these numbers, but I think we are not uh, experts to assess these numbers. Yeah? Because there are a lot of variables here, but it's from the uh, economics point of view. I think if it's a further step in the future, and I think it's quite important for these owners uh, to have better uh, numbers. Well, if this bridge, let's like, suppose this. Zero bridge or possible the government bridging is going to collapse or be paid. How is the loss of reputation of the company? This might be very crucial. It might be putting in danger the company just uh, due to the reputation, not because of the loss of a single bridge. But, and I think this economic spider of view, it's quite, it's a dimension of the problem that we, we are not forgetting, I think, but we need to be more uh, going deep, perhaps, okay. And this should be by bringing this side of uh, the economics into the discussions uh, might be also something that is in line what you said. Right? Yes, okay. Can I just add a comment on that? You know, the sole purpose of any private company is to survive and bring profit effectively to the shareholders. From that point of view, the only, really the only focus should be precisely what you are talking about. I don't if you take it to the extreme, so yes. Yeah. I don't want to go to the extreme, but it's a very important part, I think. Yeah. Private companies, I mean. Right. Well, yes, uh, so we have uh, all these uh, private companies and uh, concessionaires and, uh, and actors in the, uh, in, the, in the free economy. Uh, and of course, they need to do what they need to do to keep uh, business running and optimize their business. And, from a price perspective, this is uh, this is a good thing uh, because uh, this is what builds up the the uh, the market mechanisms uh, upon which we rely on in human society. But there is another side to that uh, sword, uh, and, and that is that society cannot sustain uh, the wholly uh, or say inefficient behavior 
so uh, there's there's no way that, uh, that that we can accept that those considerations could trigger that we will be wasting material and energy and uh, having uh, additional CO2 emissions. Uh, that is a no-go. So uh, there's clearly, uh, let's say, a field of, uh, of stresses uh, there. And uh, from a societal perspective, uh, we need efficiency. We need it more than ever. Uh, and, and focus really has to be directed uh, in, in this direction. Uh, <coughs> very interesting discussion. Uh, also, the case study I presented when we first presented the results to the Water Authority, we presented the results as net present value. And then he commented, like, yeah, but we don't really think in net present values, we think in direct costs and in terms of the, uh, the money we spend in the next year. So, so what I'm wondering is there, like, a, I, I guess there's a big difference between private companies that subcontract from government organizations. But is there amongst, and I don't know, but amongst the bridge owners or the, the real owners or the government organizations that often mention, is there really the thinking in that present value? Or do they think in other ways? So, direct costs, we just have to spend our money. I've heard that example in public finances a couple of times. Quite shocking, but it's. Well, if, if I may just come, uh, the, the Swiss government, they have a law saying that uh, any, any uh, life cycle costing uh, made on behalf uh, of one of the departments uh, of, of, the, of the Swiss society, uh, including the roadway department, um, uh, it has to follow um, and uh, discounting rate, which they dictate. And uh, they dictated, uh, I think, uh, 10 years ago for the first time, uh, this to be equal to 2% per level. Um, the same applies in, in Denmark. So any, any uh, life cycle costing made for the, uh, for the Danish uh, governmental institutions, uh, it has a big discounting rate, I believe it's around. Two and a half percent in Denmark is way too much, but uh, it's better than five or six or seven, right? Okay. In the it's Netherlands, we have three and a half percent, so we. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a good Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe that's that's because, exactly because of the point that I'm trying to make, because when I, when I went to a water board, uh, I heard a story about someone who got kind of well, punished, but that's maybe a bit, a bit hard to say like that, because he didn't spend his entire budget because he was more efficient than, than projected before. So that shocked me quite, quite badly, but it makes me think like, do we really have the incentives in the system to think in that first I don't think we do have them in all, on all levels. I think that's one of the main barriers. I think you're a very important aspect of the problem is a big barrier for uh, thinking ahead of time because you're more uh, considered with spending money you have and planning for the next year than thinking ahead. And that's the, one of the roots of the game that has to change. Exactly. That, that point you made there uh, with the given budgets and the need to exploit given budgets because otherwise the budgets for the next year will be like you just said, you know, maybe it's fine. So like, you're not, oh, apparently you don't even need your budget. <coughs> so we, you know. so uh, this thing about the box type of budget allocations in these management organizations, we did an assessment uh, of the, what what is the implication of uh, of sharing resources instead of putting them in, in, uh, in, in different boxes. And the impact is just enormous. I mean, there's so much waste in this, uh, in this traditional way of allocating money. Uh, it's, it's tremendous. And this is also why we need, to, we need not only to look at the uh, uh, value of information in documents monitoring when it comes to assets in security management. We really need to look at the bigger picture also how the assets are actually managed. Uh, because knowing uh, better 
uh, in, in, in some parts of these uh, organizational setups, uh, is surely uh, more important than, uh, than uh, measuring the deflection uh, of, of some abutment somewhere. <laughs> Just to come back to what you were saying, that uh, mostly the companies that uh, have the uh, concessions or only there to spend their budget and they have a specific box with their budget. We actually have uh, several cases of people went toward us to ask uh, uh, toward us or to have a, a offer go out just uh, so that they could prove that their structure is in good condition mm -hmm. so, that, uh, so that they can have the concessions even longer. So it's not purely for the health of the structure, but it's still a, a case where it really helps uh, to, to improve the descent of the place. Just kind of comment on you know, what you said. Oscar Wilde said that these days people know the cost of everything and the value of nothing, right? And it's perfectly sums up. So my question is, is there any kind of you know, you know, value of information and so on and then I mean it's hard right because if you know you have to pay hundred thousand now for monitoring right versus a benefit which is really risk reduction but risk reduction is really something that the risk has not yet eventuated right that's the challenge so of course the, the driver is yes I have this amount of money and I prefer to hold it rather than pay for something which is Effectively intangible, to be honest. Right? Risk reduction, you can't put your hands on it. But, but it seems to be the risks are owned by the owner, and the owner may uh, involve the concession. And so yeah, but the, the risk can be sold. But then the, uh, the basis for the negotiation should be the risks, right? Yes. And, yes, and, 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 right. and, and actions taken now <laughs> and down the line uh, in time to manage the risks. And, so this is surely the direction uh, that uh, these uh, these developments have to take. That also provides the incentives the incentives for the concessionaires to do the right thing. But but uh, and, and and we see some developments. I, I guess you also experience uh, this in the negotiations on on concessions that that risks and risk sharing is, is a part of the deal. But A has a large potential. Uh, for further developments, but realizing that risk risk is completely equivalent uh, with uh, out of uh, pocket uh, expenditures only a little bit later, according to the best available models. Right? So this is the way to understand risk, and until uh, societal decision makers uh, really appreciate that fact, <laughs> we uh, we are stopped. But but this is maybe one of, one of the most important things. We have to try to educate uh, with respect to them. Yes, sir, please. Uh, <clears throat> about all this, uh, I cannot speak for the rest of the Europe, but in Croatia, government is the owner and decision maker for the whole infrastructure system. And uh, for example, our road director, uh, their Board of Directors is chosen every four years when a government is chosen. And nobody wants to be the guy who would spend some amount of money in those four years in order to save money when you're looking for 20 years in the future. So that's the problem. I mean, if there's a private contractor who runs and manages the infrastructures, then they will think in a longer period of time, in the long term. But uh, I'm talking only about Croatia, but there uh, we tried a couple of times to talk to, talk to them, to make them uh, invest, not, not a lot of money, not a lot of money, but nobody wants to be somebody who will spend something and which hasn't been spent in the last 20 years in order to, to reduce risk in further 30 years. And they want direct, <coughs> the direct profit, or it cannot be profit, but they want to spend less, because if they spend less, then the balance is bigger, and if the balance is bigger, they will get chosen for another four years. So it's a, it's a bit tricky to, to, to convince those people 
that they should invest now in order to, to make it worth it in for 30 years? Yeah, this is unfortunately the lack of accountability we have in the political systems. Uh, so political decision makers, they are not held accountable uh, for the decisions they make. So that would also be a little bit problematic uh, because you may make decisions which turn out to have bad outcomes even though it was the right decision to take based on the information you have. So my point is that what we could and should uh, try to reach in society is that any decision, any significant decision on the administration of public goods, shared resources, uh, that they have a documented uh, decision basis, right? Uh, then we, we would be able to overcome these problems that people are, let's say, sub-optimizing their own career, both uh, in companies and also in the uh, public domain. Accountability. Uh, risk accounting decision made. Yeah, because uh, the, if in some point of time something happened, if, if a tunnel collapses, if a bridge fails, uh, the guy who is at the moment in charge will be held responsible. Not somebody who made a bad decision 20 years ago. That's the problem. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so accountability actually exists. What I understand in the asset management of payments on the roads. Why? Because the life cycle of payment is much shorter and sort of coincides with the local election, perhaps national election. It's true. I was told by, by, by road asset management manager about that. So if you have potholes, right, people complain and so on. So by and then next election cycle, they will vote current city council or whoever is responsible out. Now, bridges are a tough case because life cycle of bridges is decades and so on, right? So current decision makers, before the bridge develops problems, they will probably be already dead. Yeah, that's who cares, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. At least one time. Because they gain popularity by building stuff, and then the next generation has to take care of it. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? So from the side of, uh, of the decision makers, the owners uh, represented here, which, which would be the most important things to try to push uh, in, uh, in, in education, say? Um, I think it's very important that uh, in implementing it, you have to include stakeholders in the process so they learn to use it. They understand what the point is, and then they will, if they are integrated in the process, they will see that. I think that's the old question, actually. And in oil and gas, is where, where I worked before, it was common that we had a like, reliability center maintenance, which is conducted together with the engineer and the operator. And that is an exchange of knowledge. Which is very important and it ties the decision makers together with the process of learning, which I think is very important. I think if you talk about education, you have to go back to, to, to the university education because at that level it's already been the, the education of a student and so on. So, unfortunately, at the university, this additional information which you have, the student is more. Uh, used to apply a strict code, and this is the education in the universities, in many universities and so on. So, what it can be done in education is to bring uh, these methods more to education, to gain more flexibility, so to be able to adapt also to to new uh, technologies and, and uh, um, other methods to use, other than strict application of the code only. Maybe the challenge of education is even uh, larger when we talk about the, the education. We talk about the education in our domain, 
It's the, it's the management uh, where we may not always find solution. No, what we just said, the, 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 you know, it's a little bit about the egg and the hen uh, thing. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the opening of the horizon, uh, not always just to have to follow the code strictly. Uh, that's, I agree, for sure. But there's another approach, and it has been taken a couple of times, uh, probably many times. I remember one, uh, uh, which is an example from Norway, where suddenly, uh, already in the, I, I think it was in uh, maybe 95 or 96, uh, the Norwegian uh, code for regulating uh, offshore uh, activities specified that inspection intervals uh, should be fixed uh, but justified uh, when it came to, uh, let's say, integrity management of offshore assets. Uh, so this, and justified, uh, it certainly opened up for a completely new arena. And I, what I actually think that when it comes to uh, use of, of things that we have been developing here, maybe maybe uh, another approach is to change the code, right? And then uh, the need for education supporting the use of the code uh, will have to, will simply come, right? Because there's a need. Sure. So we do both. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 it's probably a, a two-way process. Right? So. In, in Portugal, we have fixed inspection periods, like in Germany and in other countries for British. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's fixed. Every five years, yes. we have to do the... So you have taken it probably from Germany or from another country. Or you have your own. I mean, what he mentioned is it, a very, it's a very, people like to have some fixed intervals and they, uh, either they have their own or many people think I will take it from your codes or from Alpha or American or from China. The most, pro one of the most progressive industries was the oil industry where I was. So we had also, there were also for platforms, but then the owner, uh, did a lot of investigation. For example, there were many platforms in West Africa where we worked. So we, we did a lot of campaigns, inspection, and monitoring. And we proposed another uh, time interval and maintenance interval for the platforms, also for lifetime extension, which was also applied. So the, the, the benefits were very high. So I think it is possible. That is what I want to mention. It is possible. If you look at other domains, it is happening. So. Uh, also, your example in Croatia for the bridges. But if you take tunnels, all the big tunnels in, in Europe, the Brenner Tunnel, the Gotha Tunnel is in operation, they were using this counting when they applied the safety measures. Because the safety measures, they can be some sensors for, for fire, which is 10 years, but can be also the service tunnel, which is 100 years. And in fact, if you look at the Gotha Tunnel, it is without a service tunnel. Well, the Euro Tunnel has a service plan, so there is a, there is, I am very, I'm optimistic, there is a progress uh, which happens, so I will not be pessimistic, I see a progress, and it, it, it's, it might take some time, but it will be there. But uh, if I may add, uh, they are, I think they are learning from experience, and usually, when you learn from experience, it's, it's from bad experience. For example, um, uh, in, we have on our Adriatic coast, on the highway, we have uh, six uh, big concrete arch bridges, which are really large, and they are uh, subjected to a very aggressive environment because of the really strong northeastern wind and the sea. Uh, there is a big problem with corrosion. The first arch was built, uh, I think, in the uh, 60s, yes, in the 60s. The last one uh, at the beginning of the century now, so uh, 18 years ago. Uh, when they realized that those built in the 60s and 70s have a really large problem with corrosion, and that they need to reinforce and uh, strengthen the piers every couple of years, okay, not couple, but 
every 10, 15 years. Then they decided first a big concrete cover on this the last one. It was uh, 10 centimeters and they built in permanent uh, chloride infusion sensors, etc. So the, as the investor is all the time the same, he's been creation uh, road director. They realized they if they invest more, they will maybe save save more in the in, in the further period. But they needed 40 years and five bridges, which are in really bad state, and they have to be constantly repaired to understand that. So there is a, there is a optimistic rate, but. I think it's going a bit slow. Yeah, it, yeah it's slow. It, it but you know, it's, it's your own life, which you are pessimistic. Everybody could be pessimistic or optimistic because the lifetime or the regime your lifetime is strict. But in a long term, I am optimistic, I have to say, because it takes time. I have more than 5,000 students outside, outside I'm teaching, so I speak to them. I, I have some feedback and so on. So I think it, it takes time, even for the development of the Euro also, it takes time. They are trying to change small things. They are, you see, they are, you think always they are in details, they are spending a lot of time and in bigger things, it's difficult to change. But I think that it is, in the long term, it will, there will be some, like coming out of projects like this and so on. So I would not be so pessimistic. Well, by oh, not yeah, it's not exactly. 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 It's not The horizon of optimism is different than the residual lifetime of someone. <laughs> okay, we have been talking uh, and outlining quite some issues in, uh, in decision making, and we are touching upon. Uh, these with our decision analysis because uh, we uh, add value of information analysis when we look at the machine's operation phase. Uh, yes, and maybe some uh, points uh, we can uh, really work on, some points we may be able to uh, influence, and some points uh, we are just maybe helpless. Uh, but what? Okay, but not this. Never. Never. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> um, yeah. What can we do now? We can have dinner. <laughs> <laughs>